Chapter Twenty Two of Claude Lightfoot, or How the Problem Was Solved by Father Francis Finn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Two, in which Willie Hardy acts as guide, with unfortunate results, and Claude, on being found, makes the most astounding declaration of his life. It was nightfall. The boys were gathered about the campfire discussing Father Barry's story. All of them with one exception, had been singularly moved by the narration, and it had set them thinking very seriously. "'It did me as much good as a retreat,' said Frank. "'I'd like to be like Ray all my life,' observed Dan. "'Maybe you wouldn't care about dying so young,' said Charlie. "'Shaw, sure, why not? If I could live as he did, I wouldn't care a cent when I died.' here pretty willie came in i think father barry's story was a dreadful lie take that back roared claude his eyes flashing with rage and advancing upon willie with clenched fists take that back or i'll knock you into the middle of next week elmwood's strong arm came about the passionate little fellow's shoulders remember claude remember your resolution and as he spoke he could feel the tremblings of passion which convulsed his charge's frame claude bit his lip and grew pale with anger while willie who had been on the point of taking to his heels stood off at a distance not a little out of countenance we need a horsewhip here said winter staring very grimly at willie it's about time to drown that fellow growled dockery father barry explained willie said that ray was prettier than any of us that's not so he pursued energetically and added with charming naivety i've heard folks telling mamma that i was the prettiest boy they ever saw father barry is a priest he oughtn't to tell lies like that elmwood still holding claude by the arm walked away come on boys said winter let's go and find out the address of the nearest lunatic asylum willie was left master of the campfire that claude is a fool he soliloquized gazing into the fire he is a bad boy too and willie put on a very wise look if this gentle falsifier had any moral sense he kept it from the observation of the vulgar with never-failing vigilance before going to bed that night claude called willie aside willie i'm sorry for the way i spoke to you i lost my temper awfully so you did said willie who was brushing his teeth for the fifth time that day you was very bad i know i was said claude humbly if i can make it up in any way i'd be glad willie saw his chance he was very anxious to supply himself with another bottle of perfume and certain articles of toilet which could be obtained at a village some eight miles away he was afraid to go alone and thus far had failed in inducing any of the boys to promise him their company will you come on a big walk with me to-morrow claude a big walk uh sure that is if frank will let us go just wait said willie as he stepped over to where frank was reading by the light of a candle frank i want to go to eagle to-morrow with claude oh no answered frank you might get lost lost why when i was out here last summer for three weeks i used to go every day and on some days twice every day said frank incredulously well nearly every day i miss going once are you sure you know the roads i know them like a book all right you'd better start early and take a lunch along for it's a good eight or nine miles claude could stand the walk well enough but i don't know about yourself once i walked forty miles in one day frank considered it superfluous to advance any opinion on this statement 
he turned to his book and willie departed to further the arrangements between claude and himself now willie had been to eagle once a word of explanation as to claude's burst of passion father barry's story had impressed him beyond any story he had ever heard his noble heart had been touched and softened and elevated by the character of ray sumner he had attributed ray's spotlessness to frequent communion and he had resolved that with god's grace he would try to imitate ray in keeping his soul white in making this resolution a new ardour had been enkindled within him to receive our lord in the sacrament of his love the fifteenth of august looked far away to his holy impatience ah if the day were only at hand then he would begin a new life ray would be his model for he loved that gentle firm boy who now occupied in his mind the niche devoted to all that was high and holy and sublime willie's foolish remark had fallen upon him like a blow and greatly to claude's humiliation claude had at once burst into a fit of anger poor claude his fall made him feel still more sensibly his great need of the food of the angels on the morrow claude and willie started early and after an hour's smart walking came to a fork in the road willie did not remember having seen this part of the country before which one shall we take asked claude who was tripping on in advance the one to the right answered willie promptly the other one goes to milwaukee and turning to the right the pair advanced briskly toward four in the afternoon frank elmwood became somewhat anxious the two walkers should have come back by three o'clock at the latest they had started at seven and allowing them the extreme limit they should have reached eagle at ten they were to start for home at eleven certainly not later than twelve and now it was four o'clock he hastened over to mr collins house and communicated his fears to rob oh they'll take care of themselves said rob endeavouring to comfort poor frank will they exclaimed frank claude is one of the best little fellows in the world but if there's any chance in his way of losing his life or breaking his legs he's in it every time as for willie there's no telling what he'll do he's about as responsible as a cat only he hasn't half as much conscience rob considered for a moment just wait a minute he said and i'll run in and ask mother he returned presently and said mother feels the way you do frank she doesn't trust either she says we can take the two mares betsy and virginia and scour the country come on we'll find em before night presently the two friends were galloping down the road which claude and willie had taken that morning when they came to the cross-road frank said rob you go right on to eagle and as you go along the road make inquiries if they haven't got there come back this way and follow me so while rob went on toward eagle frank took the road to the left and galloped on for about two miles when he met a man on an empty hay wagon did you see two boys of about twelve one of them very stout and springy the other very girlish looking sir the man after long deliberation made answer no but i saw a girl with a big straw hat and a tramp with a hole in his shoes much obliged growled frank urging betsy into a gallop presently he came to another road at a right angle to the one he was galloping on he paused for a moment then adopting a cautious pace continued straight on he stopped at the first farmhouse and in answer to his inquiry learned that a man with a black beard and a bulldog had passed by an hour ago a few miles further on he came upon a sight which gladdened his heart in a large field a number of farm hands were working about a threshing machine now i'll get some information he said to himself dismounting from his horse he advanced to a group of men and repeated his question the men compared notes and after going over a list of vehicles and personages that had gone by 
came to the conclusion that they had seen no small boys such as he had described passing that way one of them who appeared to be the owner of the farm made further inquiries among the men scattered about in various parts of the field and returned shaking his head no sir he said you may rely upon it that they didn't come this way if they had passed some one of the hands would have noticed them but you look tired let me give you a glass of whiskey it will brace you up thank you sir answered frank i am very tired and worried i don't care for any whiskey but if you've a glass of water handy i'd be much obliged frank weary and depressed was tempted to take the whiskey but an incident in father barry's story was still fresh in his mind you're most welcome to the water said the farmer you're the first man that wouldn't take a glass of whiskey that i've met in a long time and i don't mind saying that i respect you for it bidding the farmer a courteous farewell frank returned upon his tracks and galloped on without a stop till he reached the road at a right angle to his previous course then allowing the horse to fall into a steady trot he said a prayer to st anthony it was nearing six o'clock when he came upon a place where the road divided at a broad angle a saloon stood at the crossways and fanning himself upon the stoop sat the saloon keeper did two boys pass this way to-day sir two boys of about eleven or twelve both of em handsome little fellows and one of em pretty lively on his legs yes sir which road did they take that one said the saloon man pointing to frank's left thank you ever so much sir and frank went on with a lighter heart but his troubles were by no means over roads branched in every direction in this thoroughfare and it was only by dint of constant and careful inquiry that he was enabled to follow the young adventurers they are lost sure he said as he changed road for the seventh time since meeting the barkeeper it was nearly sundown when he came upon a lonely hut standing back a little from the wayside he drew rein and was about to dismount when his heart gave a throb of joy as he heard willie's voice oh frank i am so glad please take me home and there at the door stood willie holding in his hand a slice of bread and butter where's claude i'm tired almost to death said willie and i want to get back i'll get up behind you where's claude roared frank oh i guess he'll get home all right say let's start at once where's claude frank shrieked he's gone that way when he got this far i was near dead claude brought me in here and tried to get the woman in this house to tell us where we were she couldn't speak any english and we didn't understand much that she said after close inquiries frank succeeded in eliciting the following statements first that claude had been the cause of their losing their way frank knew this to be false secondly that the german woman had succeeded in giving claude the idea that there was a village four or five miles further down the road thirdly that claude bidding willie rest in the hut till he returned from the village where he hoped to find out where they were and if necessary to hire a conveyance and a driver to bring them home had started off bravely alone stay here till i come back said frank curtly and mounting his sweating mare he urged her into a gallop frank did not spare his mount and before the twilight had shaded utterly into darkness he saw the village in the distance nearest him of all the houses was a modest church standing away from the body of the village by several hundred yards as he drew near and with head bent forward straining his eyes to see anything that might lead to claude's discovery he discerned someone running down the church steps and turning as he ran in frank's direction while at the same time a pistol shot rang upon the air get up betsy get up he screamed for in pursuit of the running figure came three larger forms hello screamed frank at the top of his voice is that you claude yes came the voice he knew so well 
at the sound of frank's voice the men stopped suddenly and turning into a field disappeared in the gathering darkness in a moment claude had brought himself beside the mare there was no smile on his face no merry light in his eye no healthy flush upon his cheek he was pale and frank could hardly credit his senses looked frightened his lips were quivering there was a moisture that dimmed his eyes and his little hands were folded he looked very beautiful and very very serious why claude exclaimed frank thoroughly alarmed what's happened claude leaped up behind frank put his arms round his friend and pillowing his face on frank's back said please don't ask me anything now frank give me a little time to myself but drive away from here and let me pray oh frank i've just made my first communion End of chapter twenty two